John chapter 4. Make sure you've got a Bible open in front of you. It's going to be so helpful to have God's living word open in front of us. Also, so you can track that what I'm saying is what it says. That's the most important thing about this morning. We're going to read this together. So this is verse John chapter 4, verse 1 to 18. As you're turning there, this is going to give us a brilliant picture of who Jesus truly is. What's the thing that we need most today? is to get this Jesus into our bloodstreams, this gospel which we see on full 3D glorious display as we see him walking off the pages of scripture in John chapter 4. So, we all good? We got it? Brilliant. Right. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. So Madonna did an interview with US magazine Vanity Fair. You heard of Vanity Fair? Did an interview with Vanity Fair in 1991. And they're asking her how she's coping with her newfound stardom. How she deals with it all, right? What would you make of what she said? Is this going up? Other way? Right, you see that? Here's what she says. This is what they ask her, how she's coping with stardom. She said this, my drive in life comes from this horrible fear of being mediocre. I still have to prove that I'm somebody. My struggle has never ended and it probably never will. What do you make of that? She's talking about this feeling of being somebody i'm going to take a guess at what she's talking about she's talking about that deep longing inside of her to be fully known fully loved and fully satisfied and for that feeling to be permanent so every human being on this planet longs for and, and it's true isn't it we go looking for it in all manner of places job promotions House extensions, romantic relationships, online purchases. I mean, what is Friday coming up next week? What is it? Anyone know what it is? It's Black Friday, isn't it? Our world goes crazy. Purchasing things, right? Social media likes, keeping Twitter updated. And yet, like Madonna, is it not true that these things that we chase to fill this hole in our lives never seem to give us it? Is it not like climbing a mountain and getting to the top? You ever done this? You know the feeling of getting to the top and in that feeling that you realize there's another peak that you still haven't climbed yet. 
As C.S. Lewis once said, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. And into this human satisfaction vacuum, the astounding claim that Jesus makes to all of us here today in John chapter 4 is that only he can give us the thing that we are looking for. That's his claim. That's a bold claim, isn't it? I want to put him to the test on that. But that's what he's claiming, to be able to give us living water. And the added wonder of all of this is that Jesus offers it, first of all, to a society, to a woman rather, that society has concluded is a nobody. You see, if Jesus had a PR manager, someone helping him with his public image, somebody whose job it was to try and help him climb the opinion polls, they'd be freaking out at this conversation that's happening in John chapter 4. Because it defies the etiquette of the day and it goes against the expectations of the day. And what we need to understand is that Jesus, as he meets this woman, he is tearing up the boundary playbook in every single sort of way. Let me just give you four of them real quick that we see in these verses. Here's the first one. He defies the racial boundary. So if you come with me to the text, see where he is at verse four. Where is Jesus headed? He's on his way with his disciples back up north to Galilee. Do you see that in the text? So he's in the south. He's trying to get to the north. If you think about it, Judea's in the south. Galilee's in the north. And there's Samaria in the middle called Samaria. So I always remember it, right? That's where he's going. He's going back up north. And he's going through this area called Samaria. Now, what we've got to understand is that far as, as far as the Jews of this day are concerned, he stepped into enemy territory. It's a historical tension, all to do with the kind of people who live in this place called Samaria. In the eyes of the Jews, these folks aren't thoroughbred. Intermarrying, they are sell out, pick and mix Jews. Do you ever remember if you were a kid, right? Do you ever remember the Knickerbocker glories you used to get, the ice creams? Yeah? So this is how Jews view the Samaritans here. All sorts of different colors, worldly colors going on in this one bowl. All sorts of religious flavors going on. And a little Jewish vanilla, sorry, a little Jewish cherry on top. Right? Whereas Jews... Us Jews are pure vanilla. That's what they think, right? We are the pure people. And the Samaritans make a mockery of everything that we stand for. You see how John tells us, verse 9, these two groups of people, see what he says? They don't mix. They don't mix. Don't associate with each other. Hate each other. So what Jesus is doing here is the equivalent today of a Russian man popping into a cafe in Kiev and saying, can I have a quick latte, please? Is that hotly tense what Jesus is doing here? All sorts of stuff going on behind the scenes. But Jesus is defying that racial playbook as he makes this play here. And he's denied defying the gender playbook. So here is a man talking with a woman especially if you're considered a rabbi, right, a religious teacher in this day, this was seen as a waste of your time. That's why verse 27, if you want to cast your eye just over a little bit, his disciples see Jesus talking to a woman and they are surprised. You see that word in the text? They are surprised when they see this. Our English word, I don't think, quite captures the strength of it. In Greek, it's more like they were absolutely gobsmacked. Why is he speaking to this woman? And Jesus is ripping up the social playbook as well. Verse 6. When does he stop for a drink? What time of day is it? Have a look. What does John tell us? What time of day does, John stop, does Jesus stop for a drink? Thirsty from the walk as he would have been as a fully human being. He stops at noon. Now, that's the hottest part of the day. Have you ever been in a hot country? You know what it's like to be outside at the height of the day, yeah? What do you do when you go to a hot country? You plan your day around two times, don't you? The morning and the evening. 
Because in the afternoon, your inside and ear con is your best friend, yeah? When afternoon comes, you put the factor 50 on and you stick to the shade. And so this is all happening at noon, midday, the height of the day. And what would happen in this day is that women would go in groups to this well to get water. And where would it make sense to go? First thing in the morning, yeah? First thing they go to this well. And yet here she is on her own at the height of the day, which tells you what about how she's perceived and viewed in her community. She's been shunned, doesn't she? She's an outcast in this community. And life for her is now about not showing face. She went around today, she'd be wearing a baseball cap, hoodie on, shades on, doing her shopping at midnight at the 24-7 Asda. Because our goal is to get in and to get out before anybody clocks me. This is what we would say today. We use this phrase all the time, isn't it? We wouldn't touch her with a barge pole. That's this woman. So Jesus rips up the social playbook as he heads towards her. And the last one is that he rips up the moral playbook as well. Because as Jesus meets her, and this is where we'll maybe slow down just a little bit. As Jesus meets her, do you see how he brings up deliberately the most painful feature of her life to date? This is the very reason that she is being shunned in this community. And the Lamb of God goes straight for the elephant in the room. And he does it, we need to understand this, he does it not to out her, he does it not to shame her. He does this to win her. As the God who knows her and as the God who sees her and as the good physician desperate to treat her wound with his scalpel of love and of grace. And so here is the most defining feature and painful feature of this woman's life to date. Verse 16. What does he bring up? Jesus says, go and get your husband. And she replies, verse 17, really sharply, I have no husband. Back in Jesus' court, he says, you are right. But he goes a bit further. He says, you have had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. Now, listen, she's made some big mistakes in her life. I'm absolutely certain of it. But I think we need to be careful to resist the temptation to think of her like some kind of Jessica Parker figure from Sex in the City or Rachel from Friends, right? That's made its comeback on Netflix recently, isn't it? Like she's some kind of free and modern, independent woman who's casually, seamlessly slipping from one relationship to the next. Friends, she's not a 21st century Western woman. She's a first century Middle Eastern woman. She has had five husbands who are no longer her husband. The only way that that can happen in this day is through one of two ways. It's through death or it's through divorce. But as I know pastorally how that word may land for many of us, it's just the same in Brunsfield. It might bring to our minds some painful thoughts and memories in all sorts of different ways. Can I just say I'm so sorry if that's you here today for the things that you've been through. But maybe in particular, I want you to see how Jesus treats this woman for whom this has been a heartbreak-breaking reality five times in her life. Because when it comes to divorce, as I understand it in this day culturally, the expectation is that all the power to initiate that is on whose side? It ain't on her side. It's on the man's side. So could it be that this woman has been on the receiving end of this five times? Could it be that she's been used and treated like trash by men for what must have seemed like her whole life? Could it be that divorce only got easier 
for him and more painful for her as each husband came and went. And could it be that the man that she's with now won't marry her because he doesn't want the baggage that goes with her and the baggage that goes with that? Now you bring that all together, this woman's situation is heartbreaking, actually. And Jesus and this woman meet. Right? There are alarm bells going off all over the shop with this one. What is he doing with her? Racial, gender, social, moral. She is the last person on planet Earth who you would expect and you would be advising Jesus to be hanging out with. And yet he wonderfully does. Jesus to a T. I always think John chapter 4, big banner above it, she'd read this. Welcome to the dignity revolution. Jesus, maybe even the first man in this woman's life, interested in her, not because of what he can get from her, but interested in this woman because of what he can give to her. As the one who knows all things about this woman, knows everything, every skeleton in the closet, every painful moment, every ho hostile and hard word come from her mouth and his. And do you understand this? All of that stuff, it's almost as if rather than it repelling Jesus from her, it's almost as if her very need is drawing Jesus to her. And here's why I love this in the context of John's gospel. Nicodemus was the guy that you met in chapter three, right? Nicodemus, see, religiously, he would own any of us, right? He would beat us. He would out pray us, out read us, out think us at every single kind of level. He is Israel's poster boy, is Nicodemus in chapter three. And a beautiful contrast. Nicodemus comes searching for Jesus. And I love it here that Jesus initiates the loving pursuit of this woman, of Samaria's worst. Here's a book I loved recently. You might want to check this out. Author Rebecca McLaughlin, if you've not read her, she's somebody well worth reading. Powerfully puts it in her wonderful little book, Jesus Through the Eyes of Woman. She says this, we see Jesus as a magnet get the imagery here, I think it's great. We see Jesus as a magnet for those who feel like scraps of human metal on life's junk heap, picking up the broken and abused and drawing them into his kingdom of love. And what does he offer her? Okay, the two of them meet, but what does he offer her in this conversation that he has with her? And I love this, guys. I want you to get this, okay? What does he offer her? Here's the first thing, to be the perfect husband. Now, I'd never seen this before until about three weeks ago, okay? What number man is Jesus on the scene in this woman's life? There's a mass today. She said five husbands. And the one man who she's currently living with, living with, what does that make Jesus in the scene of this woman's life? He's the seventh man. He is the seventh man. That number in the Bible that always talks about perfection, about God's presence. Whereas her previous husbands had in one way or another failed her. Do you see how Jesus has come to make her part of his bride? Bride of Christ, the people of God who trust in Jesus for forgiveness of their sins. The bride of Christ. And we've got to understand he does this not through cheap grace. Not going to sweep her sin and her regrets and her shame just under the carpet, pretend it doesn't exist. God wouldn't be holy if he did that. No, he'll do this through what every husband is called to be and do for their wives, as we read about it in Ephesians 5. He does this through costly sacrifice. He will own her shame. He will pay the price for every single one of her mistakes. He will take her sin on himself. Where the world labeled her 
damaged goods. Jesus goes to the cross to make her pure. And that's your status today if you're a Christian. Love how Tim opened with that at the start. Those are the words that are true for us, not because of who we are. They're true for us because of who Jesus is. As he dies and as he sheds his blood on the cross for her. And it's almost as if Jesus reaches into her world of pain, shame, regrets, hostility. And he says, daughter, come to me and no longer let your scars define who you are. Come to me and let my scars define who you are. And in turn, by her faith in him, she comes to share in Jesus' perfect life. The Bible's word for that is righteousness. And she gets God as her father. Now, let me ask you here, right, who's getting the better deal in this one? She's not just punching, is she? This is what Jesus does for us. In him is forgiveness of sins. In him is new life. And in him is the same relationship that he has with his father. We come to share in it as well. Ever wonder why we can call God our father, why we've got the audacity that we can say that is true? The boldness, the brass neck, to see he hears our prayers. Why? Because we utter those words, don't we, as Christians, at the end of our prayers, just before we say amen. And they're not like a spiritual abracadabra, right? It's not that you say them and you'll get heard. You don't say them and you won't get heard but they encompass everything that we know to be true as Christians. How can we approach this God because of those three little words in Jesus' name? And I love it here. Jesus embodies the words that we hear every groom vow at their wedding day. All that I am, I give to you. And all that I am, I share with you. And the, all these things are true for us today if we're Christians and trusting in Jesus. This is who we are. We're his. That's why I always think it's so profound in our culture, that traditionally, when a man and a woman get married, the woman takes the man's name. It's as if to say, everything about my life now is caught up in who he is. I share his name. And that's exactly what the, the, it is to be the bride of Christ. We, our lives are caught up in his name. His name. And he stands there at the right hand of God, bearing our names before the Father, interceding for us, praying for us. Guys, talk about having friends in high places. That's where he is today, our Savior. Is not the gospel astonishingly good news? And that's why we gather to sing about it. That's why we gather to read it. That's why we gather to hear from God's word. That's why we spend time afterwards with one another. Because do you know what? I forget this all the time. I drift from it. And every Sunday, I love my congregation because they help me. They help me remember it and celebrate it and love it and live in light of it. As the old hymn puts it, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Jesus offers to be to this woman the perfect husband and he offers the gift to her Deep life satisfaction. Verse 10, take in the language here of verse 10. He offers the gift to her, living water. Verse 14, the water that I give you will be like a spring of water that wells up into eternal life. Now again, remember the context that she's in, the daily routine that she's in right now. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between home and the well. Wake up the next day, back and forth, back and forth. Remember that, that feeling when you're just thirsty all the time? Caught up in this endless Middle Eastern cycle of just always being thirsty. Jesus taps into that life reality to get her to understand the nature of the restless, of the always searching and all, but never arriving spirit that we all have as human beings. And he reaches in here and he says, I can give you by my spirit in you a spring in your heart where, your, where the thirst of your soul can be quenched so that you can go searching no more. 
And that takes us just to the first of two really quick questions that I think we need to ask ourselves. I was asking myself all week as we thought about this today. Two questions as we take in what Jesus is saying. Here's the first one. What's going into our systems? All sorts of Old Testament backdrop to what Jesus is talking about here. The most famous one is in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, where God um, rebukes his people for digging out for themselves broken cisterns. So he is the water of life, but they go trying to find their own little wells in a parched desert place. God is saying, why are you doing that? What's going into our systems? You know, in 1901, there was an American guy called John Harvey Gerdner. And he coined the term New York-itis. Because he watched the way New Yorkers were living their lives. How they're running around from place to place. Busy, 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 busy. And how he perceived that because of how they were living their lives, what was happening and what their lives were producing, in his words, was this sense of edginess and impulsiveness. Irritability, anger. And that was in 1901. You can imagine what before Facebook, right? You can imagine what it's like now, but that is the world that we're living in. A world that attaches a person's significance and worth directly to how busy they are. Right? If you're busy, you're important. You ain't busy, you're not important. It's why we go crazy, isn't it? Remember Mark Zuckerberg and came out, Facebook owner, and he talked about how he's only got one outfit in his wardrobe. You remember this? He's, only, he's got the same outfit tons and tons and tons and tons of times because he doesn't want to waste time thinking about what he's going to wear in the morning. So he's just got the same outfit, tons of them. We lap that up as a culture, thinking, oh, that is a guy that's got it together, right? Time is money and all that. Into our world that says your significance is tied up with what you do. Do you see how Jesus saves us out of this? And he says, come and find rest, not what you do, not how you feel, not how you perform. Come out of this and find rest in who I am. Now, what is true of you? Because I say it's true of you. Are we drinking from the water that he gives us? Right? Are we carving out time to listen to his voice as we open our Bibles in the morning? And are we finding rest for our souls in the precious promises of God. At Brunsfield, this is why, and it's the same here, I've experienced it this morning, it's why our meetings are soaked in scripture, because we are like sheep, desperate to find a place to lap up the water that Jesus tells us. So what we're doing is we read the Bible, and we're just lapping it up, lapping it up. You know, I've got a friend, Pete, who I see on the school run every morning, and I noticed the other day that he's got a tattoo He's got a tattoo on his inner left thigh. No, calf. That's a calf, right? Calf. He's got a tattoo on his inner left calf. And I said to him, buddy, first of all, why get a tattoo there? Second of all, what is the tattoo? Do you know what it is? It's just a little bird. And I said to him, what's this little bird all about? Do you know what it is? He told me it's a sparrow. And he says, every time I go on my bike in the morning, because what he does, this explains where it is. He gets on his bike and he rolls up his, rolls up his cycling trousers. I don't know why he does it, it's just what he does. He says, every day I look at it and it reminds me of what Jesus said is true about the sparrows. Right? You find this wonderful promise that Jesus makes. Not one of them is going to fall to the ground without God the Father knowing about it. And if that's true, how much more does he care for his children? And Pete says, I look at it every day and it reminds me how much my God loves me and cares for me. And he knows my needs. And he'll provide for me my needs, however today is going to go. Just a wonderful example, isn't it? Of somebody just drinking from the waters that Jesus gives us. Having our souls deeply satisfied with what he says is true. What's going into our systems? And then secondly, what's going on in our hearts? In terms of how we view people who are different from us. You know, I love seeing, and this is how you see the progression of things in the Bible. I love seeing the young John, John, the guy who's written this gospel, the young John learning the discipleship ropes from Jesus. Now, you can look this up in your own time, but in Luke chapter 9, Jesus passes through Samaria, 
and he's rejected. And John, along with his brother James, are absolutely fuming that they would reject our boy. How dare they reject God's king? And what they say, they say, Jesus, Luke chapter 9, will we call down fire from heaven on them and will watch as they get absolutely singed? Right? No joke. No, I read nothing. That is what they want to happen in this moment because this Samaritan people have rejected Jesus. And it shows you what's going on in John's heart, right? Anger, bitterness, outrage. It is ugly what's going on in John's heart. And yet let's assume here is John writing this gospel and he's writing as an older man. Haven't had the spirit of God working away in his heart chipping away at the things that need to be chipped away at. And he's been thinking and mulling deeply on who Jesus is. And is it not amazing what conversation that Jesus has with anybody in John's gospel gets the most airtime? What is it is almost he places right up top and he says, this is what I want you to know. This is probably more than anything else going to help you understand who Jesus is. Who is it? It's this Samaritan woman. He's gone from anger and bitter and rage to compassion and grace. How's he got there? He's got there because of Jesus. And it's almost as if he holds her up at this point in his gospel. As he holds her up, he's holding his hands up and he's saying, how wrong was I? I went all anger and bitterness And Jesus went compassion and to the cross. And his way wins. And as we close, let me just give you a case in point. And tell you about a woman who most of us in the UK might remember. Back in the early 2000s. And I used to laugh at this person. And her name was Jade. Jade Goody. She became famous as one of the first ever contestants to appear on Big Brother. And people called her the blonde South London chav. That's how she was known in the media. She was always good for a silly line where she she said something that was stupid and we all laughed at her. And a young Jade made a big mistake on a celebrity edition of Big Brother. So in the heat of the moment, she utters an unacceptable racist racist word to another contestant. She immediately apologizes for it, realizes she was bang out. The camera picks up the words, but the camera doesn't pick up her apology. And all of a sudden, she is the most hated woman in Britain, spending her days trying to avoid the spotlight with her young family. And Jade develops cerebral cancer many years after this. And the tragedy is that she spent so many years of her life believing that the cancer happened because of that word that she uttered. And she dies in March 2009 at the age of 27. But here's what I didn't know about Jade. Again, it's all about a month ago. The four weeks before she died, she became a Christian. And the minister at her funeral talked about her love for Luke's gospel. Right? And I know we're in John, but I going for Luke as well. She talked about her love for Luke's gospel and the Jesus that she met that walked off the pages as she read, read about it. She said, he said this of her. She read there how Jesus welcomed those who weren't particularly religious and how Jesus spent time with people like her, down-to-earth people whose lives like Jade's were at times flawed and difficult, but whose lives were precious to God. I think that's an amazing story of the transforming and pursuing grace of Jesus. This woman here, society had said, outcast, shunned, no hope. And Jesus, defying every single boundary, leaps onto the pages of her life and offers her life through his death on the cross. Fully known, fully loved, fully satisfied in who he is. This is what Jesus offers us today. And only he can give us it.